Hello, everyone, and hello to our guest. Uh, today we are here, I'm happy to say, to have a behind-the-scenes conversation about self-publishing a non-fiction book for your business, something that most of us don't know enough about. So we are here today with Eureka Bretmark, author of Time Alchemy, and Meredith Eaton, CEO of Eaton Press. Eureka, of course, is a time management expertise. Shall we say she has many years in time management and expertise. She's also a wonderful life and business coach for the soulful solopreneur. Meredith, CEO of Eaton Press, runs a company that has a full package of support services to nonfiction authors who want to self-publish and may not even understand all the ins and outs of self-publishing. Eaton Press can help you get your book launched into the world. So with that in mind, I'm very happy to be here. Glad you guys are here. And I wonder if we can start off with just some short introductions, a little bit about your background. Eureka, we can start with you and then go on to Mirada. Sure. Thanks, Susan. And thanks for facilitating, kind of hosting us today. So yeah, my background in a nutshell, I would say uh, is I'm Swedish. So if anyone is wondering about the accent, <laughs> that's usually one of the first questions. Uh, and then I have a couple of decades in corporate um, and I was a business analyst, became an agile coach, uh, decided that really, really, I wanted to do something else in my, in my life, in my career. So I, I sort of jumped ship in 2013 to start my coaching business and uh, my time management approach. So time alchemy really is rooted in some of those agile and scrum uh, principles and practices from software development. So that's part of the core of it. And I've applied it to personal development or personal time management. You're almost coming up next year on your 10 year anniversary yes. of your entrepreneurship <laughs> yeah. that's, that's wonderful that's amazing that is amazing yes and you're still smiling she's smiling about it <laughs> and meredith can you take a minute and i know you have been in many different places along the road or many different spots along the road tell us a little bit about your background Sure. So I did, I started out as a, a management consultant. I worked with nonprofits first, and then I started working with small businesses um, while writing and creative work was sort of a background um, kind of uh, pastime. So um, as I moved through my career and I was being a management consultant, and I really enjoyed a lot of that work and the business parts of things and thinking about things, but I, I didn't love the consulting side of it as much. So I was looking for sort of a transition um, in my career, my life. And uh, my dad was getting ready to retire and he wanted to write a book about his career as a sales uh, trainer and wanted to, to figure out a way to sort of ease into retirement without just doing full stop. So I helped him write and publish his book that was able to be sort of a halfway. So he could, instead of taking every consulting client that came, he would say, read my book. And then if you think you like what I do, call me and we'll talk. And so it was a, a really good way for him to ease into that, that period of his life. Uh, and I started realizing this was fascinating. It was fun. It let me combine my business background with my creative background. Um, and so from there, I just, I kept going. <laughs> I was the entrepreneurial spirit. I just evolved. So I've been in the publishing industry for uh, coming up on 12 years and specifically with Eaton Press, we're coming up on our uh, fifth year um, of working specifically and only with um, nonfiction authors who are writing books to grow their businesses. And I've, I've found that as my sweet spot. It lets me combine both things I love, business and writing and growing your business. So that's a great Excellent. story. Isn't that a great story? Because you're talking about the benefits that you received from helping your dad ease into retirement, but you're also putting a spotlight on how it may be very important for someone easing into retirement to highlight their work and maybe a book is exactly mm -hmm. the way to do it because people seem to want that. Yeah, for yeah, appearances, speaking engagements. I know you know a lot about that too, Eureka. It's 
must have a book. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But I also love the the process and how like I always think of things where like if something kind of attracts us, it's like, ooh, wouldn't that be fun to try? Uh-huh. to go with that and who knows what it's going to lead to like so for you it led to starting yeah. this as a business so awesome. that was that was exactly it yeah and it was just sort of one of those my um, uncle then was like well I'm working on a book in my area of expertise <laughs> and I was like okay and then off we went <laughs> a family project starting off right yeah yeah exactly I know you have a, a related unrelated um uh, entity s parent i read something about it that's for another conversation but yes helpful. that's a awesome. that is a, another Where company that, that i that i own yeah. uh because i'm an entrepreneur i can't like why why have one company when you could have two or three <laughs> um, <laughs> some people may not feel that way but i know. You, right? i don't actually recommend it it's kind of chaotic but <laughs> it is what it is okay well, I would like to say to our guests, we have um, some questions that we're going to bring up today, but we welcome your questions. So you can come online, raise your hand, or put a question in the chat, and we will definitely include your questions as well. So with that in mind, I'm going to start with a question for Eureka, something that I'm personally very curious about. Can you remember the first time, where were you, what was going on when you actually thought, hey, you know, I really want to write a book. Was it an aha moment or was it something that just kind of gradually crept up on you? Uh, probably more of the creeping up, uh, you know, version of it. But I also remember that, uh, and I know uh, you, Susan, and, and uh, another one of our guests here tonight is a Toastmaster. And one thing that actually, one of those like aha moments was when I realized that the, the speaking, the topics I was bringing up in Toastmasters and I what I was getting a little more fluent in talking about the ideas I had and the approach I had and the response I got, that I realized that, hey, I got something here that I could maybe put in print and actually, as part of Toastmasters, one of my projects there was to start a blog. So I started kind of connecting that like speaking skills into writing, like the structure of a blog and putting it in writing. And that, I think, gradually led to, huh, hold on, I kind of have a system here. What if I actually put this in a book? <laughs> <laughs> that makes total sense. And that's how a lot of people describe their path to success, like trying things out and discovering that, oh my, I have more knowledge in this than I realized. Mm -hmm. And people coming to you and say, can you help me with this? And then suddenly you start to feel like maybe I have, I have information to share that would be valuable to people. Yeah. And, and there's like a system to the madness there, yes. or there's that <laughs> a, a certain can, way I actually take people through the work. That people can learn from. Yes. And uh, in a minute, I will mention another comment that came up when my husband actually looked at the copy of your book, but I'll save that for just a minute. <laughs> I have a question for Meredith now too. Meredith, you have a, a number of years in publishing going back to 2012. How did you decide, and it may have been a little bit part of your story, how did you decide what services were gonna be most valuable to the people you might be serving? Yeah, that is a, a great question. And it has been an evolution and I think will continue to evolve as I sort of get feedback from people. And I think as the world changes as well. Um, so initially when I started way back um, all those years ago, self-publishing was a very different world and it was a very different phrase. Just the word self-publishing meant different things. So generally it was seen as an end run around having a real book. So if you couldn't get a publisher, then you would self-publish. And the quality of self-published books tended to be fairly low because the people who are self-publishing were not taking it seriously. They were not using editors or, or professional cover designers. And so it was a self-perpetuating cycle where the genre of self-publishing had a bad rap and then it was proven <laughs> by the low quality content that was coming out, but there was some good quality 
things out there. And so when I started working on my dad's book, that's when I realized that there are tools and the self part of self-publishing is very um, true anybody can do it. I never claim that it's, you know, some special uh, talent or skill that only I have. And if you don't have me help you, you can't possibly do it. However, there's a learning curve and we don't all need to tackle every learning curve, right? Like you could do it yourself. Do you want to do it yourself? That's the question. (laughs) Yeah. So, so that was kind of where we started going was, okay, what is, so we started with just the services part. So we can do the formatting, we can put it on Amazon for you. We can um, provide a copy editor then came in. Oh, we can give you a cover designer. And then after a couple of years of that, I realized um, that the population I was trying to work with, which is business people who have an area of expertise and they have something to say, they aren't necessarily writers. And again, like they don't need to be writers. I'm a writer. I can help. And writing nonfiction and writing in your area of expertise, expertise is very different than novel writing or fiction writing, which tends to be what most people think of when they think writing a book. Everybody's mind goes to like old romantic notions of, you know, people writing this, you know, thoughtful and they're in a peaceful place with, you know, <laughs> sun shining. None of that, (laughs) none of that needs to be true for nonfiction writing because you're just, you're writing in your area of expertise. And in fact, it should be a much more functional process, a much more um, deliberate process. And so then I started, I realized that I, because I kept getting these clients who were over romanticizing and over complicating the process, they were never finishing their books Mm -hmm. because they're making it this whole big thing. I need to be inspired. And I was like, you don't because this is your business and that's your inspiration. And so I started saying, you know, this book is a capturing a moment in time, just get it done, get it out. And then when things change, you write another book. And so from there we moved into providing writing coaching So helping people actually get through and, and, and realizing, you know, that in fact, you don't need a ghostwriter. If you are not a writer, you just need a writing coach, which is a much different process than a ghostwriter, much more affordable than most ghostwriters where I can guide you and give you feedback on structure and flow and all that kind of stuff. It's still your book. We're going to get through it in a short period of time, generally roughly six months or so. Um, And so that's sort of, you know, as I tried to continually meet my clients where they're at is how we would evolve the different services. And then the world changes as well. So there's different platforms you can publish on. There's Mm -hmm. Amazon changed some of their rules. So we had to change the way we did things a little bit. So, um, so we don't post anymore on Amazon because Amazon (laughs) decided they did not like having my, uh, me or my team going in and out of all these different accounts all the time. Uh, So they started, they got very upset about that. So we don't do that anymore, but we'll help you. (laughs) do it yourself. And they made it very easy for people to do it by themselves as, as, you know, we can, we can talk about. So, um, so yeah, so that's just sort of, we just keep evolving and changing. And, and, um, so now we're, we're looking at doing a very, um, much simpler process of helping people who aren't trying to write books for fame and fortune and business growth, but they have like a memoir. Um, what is a way that we can take all of our skills and resources and put it in a package that's a very low price point in a very simple process to just simply help people create sort of um, memoir or like vanity in a, in the best way possible, the term vanity uh, mm-hmm. projects. So yeah, just a constant evolution. Oh, that's very helpful. That's a little behind the scenes for Amazon too. Yes. <laughs> I did not know that. And now I do. I'm sure there's much I don't know. I, I could do an hour just on the quirks of Amazon. <laughs> So <laughs> that's probably why people choose to work with you, Meredith. <laughs> so they don't have to spend those hours. <laughs> true. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Eureka, I have a question for you. How did you decide what the goals were for time alchemy? Did that, did you have that in mind when you started or did it evolve? Uh, yes. Um, it evolved, but I think when I first when I first found Meredith, I had uh, like a mega manuscript. I had a lot of writing that was like a big 
big mess in my <laughs> in my mind because I had written a lot already, but it was not very structured, and I wasn't sure what would really be a good kind of um, way to structure it. So it became a book. <laughs> so but that you is that you were writing a book. You you had already uh, yes, started yes. to write a book uh, okay. about I think about two years. Uh, like if by now, I guess it's two and a half years. Uh, I had, I was actually part of a November, what is it called? November? Uh, yeah. 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 So yeah, I did this, yeah. okay, I'm going to challenge myself and write at least 500 words every day. Mm-hmm. So I just like sat down, hands on the keyboard, let's go. And I wrote a lot in just a month or a month, month and a half. Uh, but it was whatever sort of came to me in in that moment, whatever I felt kind of um, inspired to write about. Uh, And then I let it rest for a bit, picked it up again, let it rest, you know, so that was a couple of year process because I didn't like actually, you know, take it to the next step. And then, so that's where we entered, you know, in uh, in the uh, our work together. Hmm. Wow, that's exciting. It was that a frustrating feeling to have all of those words and all those pages and not yet quite have the plan or was it an exciting feeling? Yeah, no, great, great question. Uh, some, sometimes in the beginning of our work together, I was like, oh, I kind of wish I was starting from scratch mm-hmm. because, oh my God, how to like work through all this writing and some were kind of duplicate stuff because I had maybe a blog post and I had written a somewhat of a chapter or something so so uh, deduplicating sort of uh, all of it uh, took some effort but I also think it was probably an easy way in some ways because there was a bunch to work with versus yeah. all right like starting from kind of a blank page so you know both you know <laughs> benefits <laughs> both sounds like you had a lot of thoughts going on yeah you yeah. had a lot to say and I can just feel myself wondering how you would organize all that, even as you're talking. Yeah. I can imagine how uh, how could be frustrating that might be, or also could be really fun waking up thinking, oh, what am I going to create today? <laughs> yeah, and I think this, I mean, of course, I apply my own process to myself when I work through something, but I do think when we're um, pursuing or approaching something that is kind of a monster like mm-hmm. what you know where do I even start in this you have to just start shuffling things poke a bit try this and it kind of settles once you especially being in conversation with someone like hey or what about this or maybe I'm thinking that or, or maybe this is more like the through thread and certain things just fall off because they're not essential to that. Right. Right. So just being in the process of this, like, okay, let's see where things fall where in place. Were you willing to have it be any length or did you actually have kind of a, a length of your book in mind? Yeah, I had a, a length, pretty much what it ended up being actually like around 200 pages. Yeah, uh, I didn't want it to be some kind of Bible because <laughs> who wants who who wants to learn time management and have the time to read a Bible? That's scary <laughs> just to look at it, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> but I also fear. wanted it to be like some substance, like really, yeah. really uh, applicable, pragmatic, you know, tools in addition to some of the mindset uh, yeah. sort of uh, chapters or components of it. Yeah, very practical and useful. I remember you told me a story I liked about how you found Meredith, were listening to Meredith, and suddenly thought, okay, I need to work with her. Do you remember a little more about that? Uh, Yes, uh, I do. I think I had two uh, sort of um, exposures, if you like, before we actually connected one-on-one and talked. And one, it was two interviews Mm-hmm. that I attended one was very similar to this another one was um yeah slightly different but I just checked in on like a webinar in conversation and heard Mer- Meredith just explain how she worked with people and for me the vibe just kind of feeling like oh yeah I want to work with her 
that is like no bull. Uh, I shouldn't use swear words here, but <laughs> you know, no BS. <laughs> Straight. Okay, this is what we're working with. You know, and I loved just the the way the program was set up. This in six months you'll go from wherever you are to print ready. Mm-hmm. And just that, like, okay, let's do this, not have it be a super dragged out process. So, yeah, once we got on the phone, I was like, okay, tell me like a little bit more and the price tag maybe, but then uh, let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was ready. You were ready for that. Yeah. Yeah. You're one of the most ready clients I've ever had. You're just like, yeah. when do we start? Tomorrow? Good. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> do you ever have to uh, walk back that six month timeline, Meredith? I'm sure um, you're not in control of it all. <laughs> yeah, I do. And that is the one thing I've yet to 100% figure out a way to control because um, it is I'm not writing the book, the client is writing the book, and I can set as many timelines and deadlines and milestones as I want. And if they're going to ignore them, like they're going to ignore them, you know what I mean? And there's like, but then I, so I'm constantly trying to figure out like what I can do to better support my clients to get them through those six months. How do we break through, um, common roadblocks and, and the more, you know, every client is different, but also every client has similarities. So I'm, I'm constantly sort of refining the way I start the program, the way I set the expectations, um, And then a lot of it does have to do with once I get to know the client and find out how they respond, if they respond better to threats, if they respond better to um, encouragement. Or candy. Or candy. (laughs) Um, And so I do. So once I start really focusing how to control that, and one of the things I do build in is that if we do run over the six months because the client doesn't meet their milestones, then there's additional fees for those other months. If it's other ways, sometimes it does run over a little bit because of just factors beyond everyone's control or because, you know, it does have to be perfect. And sometimes it takes an extra week to get, you know, some things perfect. So I don't, I don't sweat that as a thing, but if, if I really have a client who just won't meet their deadline, I'm not going to have this drag on forever. So, but since I started doing that, I haven't had anyone actually exceed that timeline of their own volition. So that seems to be helping a little bit before I had that. I did, I had one client who it dragged on for 18 months Had another client Mm -hmm. who went about 10 months and then just gave up altogether. And to me, that's a failure because they don't have their book. You know, they wanted their book. They're excited to put all this time and money into it and they don't leave with their book. Um, and so I've, since I've really been trying to like crack that code of what's the perfect way to get it done, I've gotten a lot better, but it's always, it's, it's always that mix of art and science to, to get it done. I'm sure. (laughs) Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? I'm sorry. This is Charles. Absolutely. Charles, please. Okay. Sorry. So I have have two questions. One is, uh, Ulrika, how did you settle on what to keep? and what to discard and how did you go about, I mean, it's a book about time management, but how did you go about managing your time when you did the writing? I mean, did you set aside a, 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 like a late night, morning, it was around other things I'm sure that you were doing. So those are my two questions. Yeah, sure. So the first one, what did I decide to discard or how did I decide to discard certain things? So I, once we had the big jumble a little bit sorted out into like these main uh, sort of parts of the books or chapters build nicely on each other and kind of create that through, we start here, it builds on this and we wrap up a little bit actually like a uh, uh, speech at Toastmasters or, or a blog post. You've got to start strong. you got the main stuff in the middle and then you end strong. So we, we kind of got that structure set. Right. Then it became pretty clear what was not essential to carry that. Uh, and I just, I have a gazillion ideas all the time. So I, I was like, okay, when Meredith said to that, that might be your next book. You know, that <laughs> just felt like, okay, I love that idea. I love that idea. I want to talk about it. It's like, you know, I can put that to the side. I can use it as a blog entry, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, the attachment was a little bit of a a letting go and just make it just, it just doesn't really fit perfectly here. Just put it to the side. 
And if I can just jump on that a little bit and talk about our process just a little, one of the things I I think I told you and that I tell most of my clients is if there's a section you're stuck on where you like it, but it's just somehow it doesn't flow or you can't quite make it fit the way you want to fit. And we went through this several times where we would be like, move it here, move it here, um, come at it from this angle. Ultimately, if it's, if you're struggling that much, it doesn't belong. And you just have to decide. And so sometimes we would reach that point, especially towards the end when we got rid of the obvious stuff that was like, this is repetitive. Let's cut that. Well, this is just another way of saying that we'll just cut that. But then we got to, we had these couple sections and we both were sort of like, maybe if we did it this way, maybe if we put it over here, maybe if we changed the <laughs> perspective. And at the end of the day, I would just, you know what, Let, guess what? Let's take it out. Yeah. We don't miss it. <laughs> it still yeah. works. So goodbye. That, you know, so that's part of it too, is sometimes it's just that simple. You, you know, your mind knows, especially when you're the author, like it shouldn't be hard to make something fit mm-hmm. and, and vice versa. If you're missing something, you know, if you're, if you feel a jump, there's like, we, we got from A to, to C it doesn't, I miss, I don't get how we got from here to there mm-hmm. or well, missing something. Let's go back or, you know, piece. It doesn't feel like a smooth um, progress mm-hmm. from piece to piece. That's and so so often I'm I'm saying like your brain knows you just haven't acknowledged it or articulated it so trust those feelings go with them and then when all else fails take it out and see what happens you yeah, know yeah, yeah, yeah if you don't miss it interesting advice <laughs> probably applies and, to life too <laughs> right. and and I'll uh, absolutely answer your second question too but one thing you just said Meredith kind of made me realize too how um so me I'm the author so I'm like in charge of the words I decide what to write and then to when I printed it and read it I could more kind of be in the reader seat and have that experience what you said Meredith even though I wrote the words I could kind of see like but hold on this feels a bit clunky Mm -hmm. if I heard this for the first time I would be lost now so that was the physical printing. That was an interesting experience to see how, because if I read it on the screen, I would read it as the author. And when I printed it, I was read it as the reader. So that was just kind of a, huh. That, that interesting. is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Right? And, and part of it is like, there's an actual like neurological reason for it, which is about getting, you know, two in the weeds, but there, when you're reading it on your screen, your brain is ready to start typing again. And so you're seeing it. Oh, I'll add that. Oh, I'll fix that. Oh, let me just correct that. When you print it out, that's not an option. It's actually a heavier lift to change anything. If you're going to write with a pen, you have to really think, do I really need to make this change? Cause it's more effort, even if you're not actually thinking that. So it's much easier to turn that part of your brain off and stop seeing it as the writer because you have to, a the transition but b you have to think harder about what the edit is so yeah and actually even the edits for me the physical printing and scratching and circling and writing in the margin all of that i could edit better mm-hmm. in that way and then i sat at the computer and actually did the edits in the document so that's sort of a, a third layer of it I guess you know me it, as yeah. the editor <laughs> it's and and that's one of those things where I I can't force the client to do that I always suggest it I, and that's always how I do it too I print and I sometimes I just print a chapter I print the whole thing I go through it you know the whole thing and so I'll sometimes have clients who are like oh that's so much paper I don't need to um and then eventually they'll get fr- so frustrated with the piece also it's hard um scrolling going back and forth you really start to lose track of what came first what where am i especially if you're in a phase of moving stuff around if stuff's disorganized the scrolling will make your brain just fry and so you have so i you know you have sometimes have to lay it out literally move the pages Mm -hmm. and then it all comes together Mm -hmm. so um but but that that's Mm -hmm. one of those examples where i'm like i really highly recommend that you print it i can't come to your house and hit print so <laughs> you do what you think is right <laughs> but and then maybe did that answer your two questions the first question yeah, first, I didn't the first, touch. yeah the first question about and the second one's when and it's out this sort of prompted me to, for another question is in terms of your i mean i i'm big on handwriting and notes and i get ideas in different places i don't i'm not always sitting at the computer 
So um, how much of the process was schnibbles of paper that you coalesced and then, and then grew from there in the terms of those ideas? Yeah, um, I Both. think first congratulations that you know that that works for you. Because I right. think that's kind of the main thing is if that works for you, kind of go with that and work with that. I do like a longhand, like journaling, brainstorming kind of stuff or mind mapping. So I, I like pen and, you know, pencil and um, paper mm -hmm. as well. So certain aspects and if I needed to kind of let myself loose a little bit more, I would write by hand. Because typing in a document feels uh, too, you know, like you're sort of committing more or something. Right. So sometimes the pencil and, and paper just helps to like, okay, let's just go with it, whatever. I don't have to create something right now. Just let it kind of um, come out a bit. So, okay. and, and then, then to add, uh, as answer your second question about my use of time management as I wrote the book and it's so the way I approach any like project or task is, is really what I'm writing about in the book. <laughs> so, it, and it really is often it's week by week thinking like, okay, this week, okay, maybe I had my meeting with Meredith. This is what's going on. How am I going to get that done? And then certain weeks it would be, I need uh, two full afternoons heads down super focused work or I need you know sometimes it's like go for a walk and let things percolate a bit and see how it shakes out so I would just like really depending on what was um, what the commitment was for the week and say how will I best get that done so it's a little vague, uh, you know, answer. It's not like I had a, a very specific schedule every week. Um, I can imagine for someone who has not yet written that it probably would be good to say, I'm going to write, you know, every morning for half an hour or every half of the day on Saturday or, you know, whatever it might be to get, you know, get your butt in the seat and do the writing. Mm -hmm. uh, but since for our work together, it was more of phases of, okay, now we're like shuffling things around, trying to find the, uh, you know, the structure. Another week it might be to fill in that B, you know, the gap we had identified, like, how do we get from A to C? Oh, I have to write this piece now that actually helps kind of bridge that. And then of course, later in the process is, it was, um, you know, cover design, what am I even looking for? I had to go to the bookstore and, and look at what, what do I want as a cover <laughs> and, and submit that. And there was a, you know, a lot of back and forth with a cover designer. So really depending on where we were in the process, it was very different, I would say. Okay. And I, I can add to that a little bit and say I have other clients who definitely have used the process of setting aside a specific day. So one of my uh, recent clients, she found Saturdays were her day that just worked for her really well. So she would work from about four o'clock Saturday to about 10 o'clock Saturday night. There was her kids weren't bothering her. She didn't have work stuff. You know, it was great. So she wrote, I would say, 90 percent of the book on Saturdays and then, you know, didn't always work. Sometimes as we switched, you got to the end of time time sensitive issues, you have to get a rewrite done by a certain day. Da, da, da. So she would work on it during the week, you know, she had that flexibility, but for the real thinking, and she was very much, she was starting from scratch more um, in her book, she didn't have as much um, existing writing to pull in. So for her, she really needed that quiet time to, to focus mm -hmm. and write. So it's like, everybody's different. Everyone has their own process. Yeah. It sounds like you're very in tune to what your clients habits turn out to be or how they actually do things in a way that makes them feel good? I, I try to be, and I'll, I'll tell a quick story. So I had a client who started with me right before COVID. So we had started, I think in January and then COVID started in March, you know? So she was very focused on like, oh, this is great. I can just, you know, use this time to write my book. But, um, 
she had a really hard time focusing because it was <laughs> the beginning of the pandemic and like nobody could focus. The world was and, changing yeah, very quickly. <laughs> rapidly. Um, but then as, so I felt like I wasn't as in tune with her. It was the first time I'd had to be very conscious of how I was in tune with my client because there was all these outside distractions. And so it's very hard to get on the call to not just be like, have you heard, did you hear this? I heard scientists found this, you know, March, April, that's all anybody was doing. So trying to keep um, her focus. So that was the first, I really had to be a self-awareness. I hadn't known I needed prior to that, but then also she um, turned out to be very resistant to feedback of, of her process. So she would get stuck and she would write to me and she would say, because my clients have access to me 24 seven, even outside of our meetings. And so if you're stuck, I'm like, get to me, send me a message. I'll help you get unstuck. I don't want you coming to our meeting and being like, I got nothing done because I was stuck. So she would say, I'm really stuck. I can't get past this point. And so I would say, okay, great. Here's three things that I recommend. Here's what I found helps. Here's specifically for you, for this piece you're in. Here's what I think will help you get through. And her response was mostly, no, I don't want to do it that way. I just want to <laughs> I want to stay <laughs> stuck. <laughs> I was like, I, I, I know why you're stuck. Um, and she had these parts that weren't working. And I kept trying to explain to her, like, they're not working. Maybe they don't need to be in the book. And she, no, they didn't need to be in the book. They have to be in the book. And so she is the only one of two clients I've ever had who never finished. And it just sort of like, and I gave her extra months because I felt like the pandemic had distracted us. And, it, it, you know, so as, as we had, I think a total almost, almost nine months. And at some point I realized I was not doing her any favors by letting it just go on and on. Um, and so I finally was like, look, you can keep paying or you can do this on your own. But um, I realized I needed to have a more um, carefully crafted process and a more, I needed to pay much more attention in the beginning of my relationships with my clients so that I didn't have that situation happen again, because I it does not serve me for my clients to not finish their books. Like, I don't, you can pay me for the whole thing and, and that's fine. But if you don't finish your book, like, what are we doing here? So, um, so that, so since then, that was my lesson out of that. So I really do put a lot of time and effort into like making sure I'm like really understanding and hearing even what the client doesn't know they're saying and doesn't know what's happening because that's the best way that I can help them get across that finish line and make sure they not just have a book, but have a book they love and are proud of when it, when it's done. That's probably very comforting for your clients to know that you have that strategy that you're so. not going to let it drag on and on forever, that there really is a goal. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to help them stick to it. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's why you need that. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. hard. And, and I'm very upfront too, of like, it's intense. Writing a book in six months is not easy. You know, you really do have to prioritize it, really do have to commit to it. And if that isn't where you're at in your life, then let's not, let's not go forward. Like that's definitely not, I'm not trying to set anyone up for failure. I'm not trying to set anyone up for frustration, you know? Eureka, it sounds like that process worked well for you yeah. with Meredith. Yeah. yeah, no, it definitely did. And I think the, the six month commitment or like the let's really do this now. And I mean, I don't want to spend extra money. So if I pay for something, I'm going to show up and do the work. <laughs> but, you know, six months uh, also, I, I really like that as a time frame. Well, for me, it really worked because it's. It's sort of within a time frame you can envision. If it's right. longer, it kind of gets like way out there somehow. So it's like, okay, it's now. I'm actually doing it now. I'm not, it's not like sort of soon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that uh, helps a lot, I think, with that time frame too. Just a thought, Eureka. You mentioned you had quite a bit of information and in writing out when you actually met Meredith. Do you think you would have found that six month still the right time frame had you not already created quite a bit? Yeah, I, I don't know. But I think that, like I kind of said, in one way, we did a lot of work shuffling things instead of writing. So I, I assume my, my time would have been more focused on like probably have like a structure created and then fill it in. Right. which in some ways would have been maybe quicker, easier in some ways. But, 
No, but but uh, it also would have taken more time during the six months, I think, because then I would have right. to actually do the writing. So, right. yeah. Right. Might have been quite a benefit to you that you had already put that much thought into it. You knew. Yes, I, I assume you, so. Yeah. Where you and also going. whether someone, I mean, you're probably a better person to answer this, Meredith, based on your experience, but I imagine that someone who if they're very clear on their, like the process or the thing that they want to communicate in their book, the writing can probably come pretty easily. But if you're not even clear, what is this that I want to convey? Then if you're gonna do the shuffling around and the writing, that sounds like it would be a lot. <laughs> yes, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, that could, that could be a lot. I've, I've encountered that a couple of times. And, um, I've encountered the thing most people have stuff written. I, I've really never had a client who has nothing who like, mm -hmm. because if you've been in business, you've written something, you've written social media posts, you've written a presentation, you've written emails to your clients with answering the same question over and over and over. So you ever, that what was what I say, you're never starting. Pull cool, all that in, yeah. So we always, that's always the first step is take what you've got, take, you know, if you're one of these people who writes those long, like educational story, social media posts, that's a lot of content. One, I forget, but at some point I did the math of the average length of those Facebook posts um, and the average length of a book. And it was like, you know, three months of social media posts is your book. Um, if that was how you were mostly communicating with your, with your audience. So that's, you know, really where we start. So there's always some amount of like the shuffling and the writing and then some write a lot more, some write a lot less and everyone just has a different process. I have clients where our check-ins are 15 minutes and they're just like, okay, I did. What do I have to do next? How's it going? Good. Thanks. Staying on track. And that's it. And at the end, their book is done. And mm -hmm. like all they needed was to know that they, they had to have that money come out of their account every month. And they had it look me in the eye twice a month. And that was all they needed. And mm -hmm. the book was done. <laughs> so, and then I've had other, other people, I've had to set up co-writing sessions to help them stay on track. And I've had to hook them up with uh, other accountability partners because they needed so much support. Um, so everyone is, is very different. Mm, sounds like it. I'm going <laughs> to take a minute and ask Charles if he has other questions that he might want to put out there at this time. Some time ago, I was doing a master's in education and, uh, and just started looking into that and did and just sort of, you know, I interview children and their interpretation of something and how it you know, varies from one person to the next. And uh, it's, you know, it's kind of complicated and I'm not, I'm not sure what the definitive uh, outcome would be. And if it's, you know, worth anybody's, you know, I don't know, time. And I guess that's the part about writing is that you, you really have to believe and based on your experience, obviously, Ulrika, you've had a lot of experience working with people and you have, you have a lot of stories, which I think I haven't read your book and I, hopefully I can meet with you on, um, I've signed up for your, your event on Saturday. Yeah, um, but but I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that a lot of, a lot of your ideas stem from, from first, uh, first person experiences with, uh, with, with clients and, 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 the, and their struggles, you know. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's probably many different reasons to write a book, but uh, if you want to convey something that you hope will be useful to many people, uh, it's good to, you know, whatever ways you can test it before, if it's, you know, blogging and conversations with clients to kind of get your own sense that, wow, this actually seems to be useful for many people. So whatever ways you can uh, right. just put it out there, start have you know testing your ideas. That would okay. probably be a good start. Yeah. Great, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off. I have to get back yeah. to work. I, okay, I, I, All I, right. I totally totally appreciate this opportunity to to interact with you guys and and thanks thanks for the time. Thank thanks you for joining. Thanks for coming. Right. Take care. Bye bye. That leads right into a question that I was going to ask you, Eureka, and you've answered it partially. What do you think is the most important piece of advice you would give to someone if they came to you and said, I'm thinking of writing a book? <laughs> what would you say to them? Yeah, I think I would say 
I would ask them. That's what I tend to do. Ask a lot of questions. <laughs> Good you know, start. <laughs> what, what would you hope to get out of it? Like, what is really the pull or the what, what makes it seem like something you're even considering? And just for me personally, it feels like I had two kind of main objectives. One being to clarify even for myself, like it almost like, grounded my ideas because I wrote it and it's in written form it's you know in people's hands it's a real thing, a thing. yes that it just really gave uh, um, I don't know gravity what's the word like solidity to Absolutely. my yes. approach yeah so uh, in a way that I can own that more fully and the other objective, of course, is, you know, for my business and, and getting, I really believe in what I wrote, obviously, I mean, <laughs> but that this is useful for people. So if this can be, uh, you know, not even $15, like $14 book from Amazon, that can really help people. I, I'm super happy if it can get into people's hands that, maybe wouldn't you know work with me one-on-one -on -one. I wouldn't end up in one of my you know presentations or, or workshops or something that I do so just as a way to really hopefully get it out there and uh, support more people that really fits with your the other parts of your background too where you do actually try very much to contribute back to society and to those that might be helped by you and all the things that you do. So that's good to hear too. Meredith, I'll ask you the same question. What's the one piece of advice you would give to someone who came to you and said, I have an idea, I'm ready to do this. <laughs> what do I do? Well, I also start with a question and my question is similar in that I say, what is your objective for this book? What is it that you want this book to help you accomplish? So do you want to get more speaking engagements? Do you want to establish yourself as a thought leader in your industry? Um, do you want to uh, have it be a launching pad for um, an e-course or a career transition? You know, what is it that you're really trying to accomplish? And if you don't know, then that's your first step is you really need to think about it because that is going to decide so many things about your book. So using Charles's example, you know, the topic that he's talking about can, like he said, go a million different directions. And so you're going to have to pick, he's going to have to pick a direction. And the way that I would recommend is to really get in touch with what he wants to use it for. Mm -hmm. um, and so if someone says, you know, I want to get more speaking engagements, I want to be a keynote speaker at big conferences across the country. Well, then you need to write a book that shows you're engaging that you are a subject matter expert, that you are going to be able to keep the attention of an audience. So you don't want to write a book that's just like facts and figures and like just dull and dry. You need to bring in personality. If you don't want that and you just want to um, uh, be a subject matter expert, you just want more clients, well, then you can have a book that's more detailed and, and has more facts and figures and isn't as engaging. Um, and so that will help you decide what goes in and what doesn't and what is that focus. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, because that much. even would decide, um, or it did for me anyway, like the main purpose of the book, like mine is to, I actually want people to have tangible something you can do with it I don't mm -hmm. want it to be like oh what an interesting idea it was actually like no I can apply this use it mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so the then the structure what we had in the book was building that like give yes. them the main tools to actually implement this in their lives so that mm -hmm. objective was definitely guiding mm -hmm. how what what ended up in the book, what was cut out, and uh, so forth, yeah. And, and we use that at times where we're like, you know, what do we do? Do we go here? Does this stay in? Does this go out? And say, well, what does this serve the objective? Is this answering that question, you know, is this too much? We had a section that was um, just very philosophical. We were up in the clouds. And I really like the content, and you really like the content. But eventually we had to say, 
this, this is too much. It's not applicable. Like they cannot apply. So we need to fix it. We need to break it up Mm -hmm. and we need to bring in exercises and we need to get down to the core and stop being in the clouds and get to the concrete stuff. And so that was this constant check-in anytime we're at like a, a, a fork in the road was how we would navigate mm-hmm. it. Well, a real life example of a stumbling block and a decision that was made. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have a feeling that we have many more <laughs> parts of this conversation that we need a part two. So since we're coming up on the hour, I thought I would take a minute and see if there's anything you would like to add Eureka or Meredith to this conversation? I mean, I would just say if someone has a book in them, make sure you partner up with someone because I think it's um, probably impossible to do it or not impossible, but to do it on your own and get like all whatever ideas and all the possible ways you got, you need someone to bounce it off and, and sort it through uh, I would not have been, you know, having this book in my hand right now without that support. Good advice. And maybe you can share that at your book launch party this weekend too. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. And Meredith, anything, any closing remarks you'd like to make? I, I, I'll go along with that same sentiment that um, it is really hard to do in a vacuum. So you don't necessarily have to hire someone, although there is a advantage to that because there's a different accountability and a different structure that comes in if you've, if you're paying an expert to walk you through the process. But Other people may have, you know, you might have a a colleague who has the same, they're also writing a book. And so the two of you together can provide that structure as long as you are the type of people who really will be, hold each other accountable, you know, and be reliable on that. But trying to write it in a vacuum, um, I've never seen that be successful. Either it just goes on forever or you get it done, but it's kind of a mess (laughs) and you really have a lot more work to do to make it work. And, and I think to me, the saddest thing that I hear is when someone's like, Oh, I spent a year on this book and I just abandoned it. Or I spent all this time and I just, I got sick of it. I started to resent it because it, I couldn't make it work. And I, I moved on. Um, and so, which also ties to my other most common thing I'll say, which is don't overcomplicate it. You're not writing the next great American novel. You're writing a book to help your business. <laughs> just treat it in perspective right? exactly treat it like any other business investment you don't you know belabor your website with romantic notions of the process like your book doesn't need to be that complicated either just decide just do it focus get it done and move on <laughs> thank you well thank you both so much and eureka i see you put up some information about how people can get in touch with you yeah and meredith also wonderful yeah. Well, this was so interesting. I have many more questions I could ask, I know, and I'm sure others do too, but we probably want to take a break and refresh ourselves here. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And I just want to thank you, Susan, for hosting us, your innate curiosity and just being part of a conversation felt so fun and natural to have together. And here's uh, Susan's uh, contact information too, mm-hmm. if you want to find out more about what she does. Or um, and yeah, thank you both of you for showing thank up you. for this. I enjoyed it tremendously. Me too. Me so too. It was great to have the conversation. All right, everyone, have a great rest of your day, and we'll meet again soon. I hope. <laughs>